people online. Um, this is being uh, video recorded, but not in a way that captures the audience. So if you're in the audience, I don't think you're being recorded. Um, just Sasha is. Uh, so it is my real pleasure um, to be here uh, introducing Sasha Altman de Brawl, um, who is really an incredible trailblazing leader in terms of radical mental health, um, activism in the mental health space, alternatives to kind of conventional psychiatry, um, and doing so in a way that really departs from kind of a polarized uh, older forms of anti-psychiatry or critical psychiatry. So the Icarus Project, which Sasha co-founded, um, led for many years, uh, really tried to adopt a different kind of positionality within the alternative mental health space that was not, for instance, about dogmatic rejection of um, medications or diagnostic labels, but sort of like, you know, kind of taking up experiences um, in a way that was empowering and oriented towards really community building and solidarity. And a lot of this work kind of drawing on the sort of zine movement and punk scene of the 90s. Um, Sasha now lives in California, uh, both working in kind of direct practice, private practice, but really outside of kind of insurance-based psychotherapy and uh, continues to speak, consult, and train really all around the world, across the US. Um, he and I had the pleasure of working together for a number of years when he was at the Columbia University um, New York Psychiatric Institute. Um, and again, I will turn it over to Sasha now. Thank you guys all for being here. It's such an honor to be here, and I have to tell you, just as we're getting started, uh, I live I live in Los Angeles, and I have I have three-year-old twins, and currently in my life, there's not a lot of time where I'm doing anything except working, like going back and forth between my office and home, and just being a dad. So just like for the last couple of days, I've been in a hotel room, like a block away from here, and I've just been able to sleep and, 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 and write and read um, and it's been it's been wonderful um, so the talk that I'm going to give you is I'm going to say some things that I've never said before uh, to to a group of people um, but it's some stuff that's been kind of bubbling up for a while I, I really what I really want to get across at the beginning is that I'm, I'm the person standing up here talking to you, but I'm also a representative of something much larger. There's a larger movement of people who are trying to change the mental health system and trying to do it in a way that's not um, conventional. And I think that's what we need right now in the world that we're living in. I, I, so, okay, so I'm gonna show you some slides and, um, and my, <laughs> My, my slides kind of will uh, give you a sense of give you give you a sense of where my head's at. <laughs> okay, so um, it feels first of all like a, the the ability to be able to, to speak publicly in these times. Uh, you know, it's such an honor just to like that. There's like people listening to what I'm saying. You know, because I feel like we live in times that are where we're strangely connected. Like we can see see each other all online, but we're usually just alone in front of a screen somewhere. Um, and so the fact that there's actual physical people I'm in the room with uh, feels, feels really good to me. I'm about to give you a talk about um, uh, psychosis and madness and, and, and transformation, but I can't, like, I have to put it into context. We can't, like, I'm gonna tell you some really personal things about myself because that's, that's just the way that I do it. I, I talk about personal things. But I feel like we got to mention the fact that, like, we're, we're living in crazy times, y'all. Like, in a couple days, there's going to be an election, and this motherfucker who's a fascist might get elected and, and destroy our country. 
And I feel like if we don't just like acknowledge, I don't know how you all are feeling about it, but I'm, there's parts of me that are terrified about what's going on in this country right now. Um, and so everything that I'm about to say, I want it to be in that context. Um, but I'm also, a, you know, I'm a therapist and I work with people. I don't, I don't, how many of people have heard of the internal family systems model? Yeah, you know, like everyone. Great. Well, I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but I'm just going to say that, that uh, for me, the way my, my coping strategy in this world is to understand that everybody has a bunch of different parts. Like, I just named a part, right, myself, like the, the terrified part, the part that's terrified about what's happening. In, in, the, in the therapeutic model I believe in, I think we all have a bunch of parts, and those parts have relationships with each other but that fundamentally everybody has a core self that has these qualities that are on the screen here for you, you know, curiosity, creativity, calmness, and that's, the, that's like our natural leader. I'll leave it at that, but, but I'll, I'll just say like, while you're listening to me talk, I would ask you to see if you can notice what's coming up for you. What are some of the parts that come up as you're talking, as, as, as I'm talking and you're listening? And see if, see if you can stay curious about it. That's kind of like the, you know, when, when we talk about polarization, the thing about polarization is that there's like uh, political polarizations, but also all of us have polarizations inside each other. And, and I really believe that um, what, what's going on inside of us internally reflects what's going on outside of us in the society and vice versa. We'll come, we'll come back to that. Alright, so that's me and my kids. Um, this is my external family system. <laughs> Having kids is like an amazing way to, uh, to, to, get, to, know, to get to know yourself. <laughs> um, so a few things you should know about me, um, I'm someone who spent a bunch of time locked up in psychiatric hospitals starting from the time I was 18 and until I was 33, I got locked up a bunch of different times. And not like, uh, not like chill lockups, like really intense, like police holding me down, court orders to be forcefully medicated, shot up with Haldol in jail cells, shit like that. <clears throat> When I was 27, I co-founded an organization called the Icarus Project, which I'm going to tell you a little bit more about, but it's basically a network of peer-based mental health support groups, um, where it's like it like ended up being kind of a magnet for really interesting people to find each other. And I've been writing about it for a long time. Um, I mean, we started Icarus in 2002, so that was a while ago. Um, I went and got my master's in social work. I went back to New York City where, I, where I'm from and got my master's in social work some years ago and then I worked in the public mental health system. I'll talk to you about that. And I currently work with a group called the Institute for the Development of Human Arts, which is like a training institute for mental health workers. And I'm really interested in the relationship between what goes on inside institutions and, and what's going on outside institutions and how people on the outside can affect things like so I have this uh, metaphor. So that's, I've been I've been playing with this metaphor for many years. H how many people here have ever grown a garden? Raise your hand. It's like half half the people here. That's good. Um, so the thing you learn when you grow a garden is that you have to pay attention to what kind of soil you have. You know, there's like obviously the plants you're growing, but the soil is really important. And soil can be divided up into um, topsoil and subsoil, and then there's the bedrock below that feeds what's in the, the subsoil. And, you know, most plants grow in the topsoil, and the, um, the, the topsoil is like a, <clears throat> you know, where a lot of the, the organic matter is, but then there's some plants like dandelions that have deep tap roots, go down into the subsoil, pull up nutrients from the subsoil, and then break down into the topsoil. I think this is a really good metaphor for thinking about culture. I think there's a lot of things that happen in the mainstream that are easy to see, and then there's things that happen in the underground, meaning things that are not so easy to see, and that the things that happen in the underground have the potential to affect the, the mainstream. And that's kind of the, 
strategy that I've been working with for years, thinking about the stuff that my friends and I do in the underground. Because the thing about being in the underground is that you can do things you can't do in the mainstream. You have, you, you're, you're not, like once things get to the mainstream, they get kind of watered down and changed and there's different power dynamics, but in the underground you have more power to control things um, and you can, you can build with your people. So, um, <laughs> let's talk about the mainstream for a second. <laughs> so, the, the way that there's this, there's this great, the way to basically say it is that we, there's, a, there's a dominant model of how we think about mental health and mental illness, and it's, it's the biopsychiatric model. It's the idea that the way we're going to understand like, what mental illness is, is through the, 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 the chemistry in people's brains. And it's, a very, it's, a very powerful, it's a very powerful story. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's hegemonic, meaning it's like the, it, it, it's, you just take it for granted. It's just the given. What a, what, what a society says. You know, and, and when we look at this, this model, this way of thinking, there's some basic things about mental illness. You know, it's like, a, it's like a health condition, like heart disease or diabetes. It's no one's fault, not the person's, not the family's, and it's a treatable condition with medication. I mean, at least that's what, when I was 18 years old and I got locked up in a psych ward, that's what they told my mom when she went to the NAMI meetings, you know. And, and it's really important. We'll come back to it, but I think when we're talking about the, the, the mainstream and the underground, we have to understand, like, well, how did, the, how did this model get to be so, so, so powerful? We're not going to delve deep into it, but um, I'm basically just going to say right here that, you know, the, what I ended up doing with my friends and I was lucky enough to be part of um, a subcultural community before I, I founded the Icarus Project with my friend Jax, um, is, is we created a different way of thinking about what mental illness is, what mental, you know, like, and, and what we said, as Nev alluded to a, a moment ago about polarization, we were really clear when we started the project, we said, um, if you take psychiatric drugs, or you think psychiatric drugs are poison, you're welcome to be a part of our community. And if you use diagnostic categories like bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, or you think all those categories are complete bullshit, you are welcome to be a part of our community. And what that did was it depolarized a, a space that had been very polarized, and it created a, a, a a space for a whole bunch of people to talk who hadn't been talking to each other. Um, there was like kind of it was like there was like a knot. There was like, like where people couldn't get through, and somehow we did something that opened up space to unravel that knot a little bit. I ended up like interestingly enough, I ended up after I went to to social work school, I worked at a place called. Um, the New York State Institute, uh, the New York State Psychiatric Institute, which is considered to be the most powerful psychiatric institute in the world. It's the place where, like, they they get all this money to do like biological schizophrenia research, which, by the way, has like like amounted to nothing. <laughs> um, but the, it's like it's a, this very powerful institution, and they hired me to work at this place that was a. Um, called the Center for Practice Innovations, and it was like a first episode psychosis program um, trying to work with young people diagnosed with psychotic disorders. And I was put in charge of developing the peer role at, at, uh, at On Track New York. And it was interesting, because I went, so there we go, I'm coming from the outside, but suddenly I'm on the inside, and I spent three years on the inside, and I learned a lot of really interesting things about being on the inside. Um, the most important one was that I did not belong there. <laughs> I, had to get, I had to get out of there. Um, I, have a, I have a good friend and mentor named Brad Lewis, who is a psychiatrist. And he became a psychiatrist in the early 80s, and then probably had a similar experience to me, and was like, I gotta get out of here. And he, he went back to school, and he got a doctorate in, in philosophy. Um, and he's a really interesting guy. And he's the one who really hipped me to, to realizing that 
the way we think about psychiatry, the way we think about mental illness, the way we think about psychosis, um, it is based on it's like I don't know your campus, I don't know like where the where the where the different buildings are, but but basically it's like there's two different sides to the academy, right? There's like you have the what's trying to be like a hard science, you know, like the, the DSM is trying to be a hard science. And then there's philosophy and there's art and there's literature and there's all like like the way people have thought about what we call mental illness for thousands of years. And I think in some ways what I was doing when I was at the Psychiatric Institute was I was training these folks who were called peer specialists, who were folks like me who had been diagnosed with a mental illness, to, to work on these, these coordinated teams. And what I would say to them was, listen, the thing on the left, the DSM-5, you want to have nothing to do with that. You don't, I, you don't need to read it. You know, like, don't, like, it, it's not going to be helpful to you. You have access to everything else. All the different ways of thinking about, like, the human condition. And that's, like, I feel like part of what we need to understand is that so many of the answers to our issues, we already have them, you know? There's just these, there's these things that are, are, are holding something in place in society. And I have to say, as I, I've been showing this slide for a number of years, but never more have I given a talk like this and thought about the society that I'm living in and thought about how, oh my goodness, you all, things are going to change so much, so quickly, you know? Ten years from now, it's going to be unrecognizable, the, like the world that we're living in. And what, like, crisis is scary, but it's also like, it's an opportunity. And that's part of what I'm trying to transmit. That's part of what I'm trying to transmit to you all, is that there's actually there's great opportunity if you can think about stepping outside the box. So, there's a whole wealth of, of knowledge that I'm trying to, to, to summarize in one slide. <laughs> and so I'm going to read you this quote. It's by Joseph Campbell, who is the guy that, um, he's like the guy who really popularized thinking about mythology in the United States. And he was very inspired by Carl Jung. He's kind of the guy who translated Carl Jung for Americans. So it's a way to think about it. So what does Joseph Campbell say? He says, The psychotic drowns in the same waters in which the mystic swims with the light. I'm going to read it again because I like it so much. The psychotic drowns in the same waters in which the mystic swims with the light. This quote really appeals to me because as someone who has definitely, you know, found myself drowning, it, it brings up all these really good questions, like, what's the water? What's the water that we're talking about when we're talking about like these, these, these same waters? Um, and we're not going to go deep into that, but I'm going to tell you a story that'll, that'll hopefully you know, bring up some questions. So I really like telling stories. I think stories are like where it's at. I'm, I'm, like, I'm kind of allergic to numbers and research. I'm glad that there's people like Nev who are like into that stuff, because I just don't, I don't, want, I don't want anything to do with it. It's not how my mind works. In fact, the, the truth is that there's like a bunch of things that I do all right, but there's actually like a bunch of things that I'm really, really bad at, and I've always been really bad at, like since I was a little kid, and I think that there's, um, I think some people are just like, you know, have a much harder time in this world for, for, for various reasons. You know. um, one of the things when I started working at the Psychiatric Institute that was really stark was that, I don't know, within the first week or two I was there, I realized people were using the language of serious mental illness as a way of masking a whole bunch of other stuff. They were like using the language of serious mental illness to mask structural racism and, and poverty and just like, like, like gross economic inequality. 
you know, like, like there's a way that, there's something about the society that, that we live in that we individualize, we're like, that person there, they have a mental illness, but without looking at the context of like how they grew up or what is actually like going on around them. Um, and I don't know, one time someone told me that they said something that I thought was very wise. They were like, when you're a writer and you're trying to write a story, you basically have to exclude everything except for what you're writing, which can be a really hard thing to do. You know, everything's like flooding in. So we'll see how I do telling this story. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and tell it in a way I haven't told it before. So there, there's this language that they, they use in the system. It's worth really, it's, it's worth really saying. I, I can be so much on the outside that I can forget to give props to all the people who've worked so hard um, to to actually affect like concrete change in the mental health system. There's a whole recovery movement in mental health that has really helped shift things. It got me my job at the Psychiatric Institute. I wouldn't have been working there, you know? The peer specialist workforce. Um, but so that when, when this language of talking about being like an expert, expert by experience, that I, I think of it as coming from the recovery movement. Um, and I just, what was I saying? I was saying something about like mainstream and uh, and, and underground, there, there's a there's an there's an interplay between the two. All right, so um, I wrote this article when I was 27 years old called "The Bipolar World," and it was about being diagnosed with bipolar disorder and how I didn't really I I didn't really I simultaneously thought that the whole system was full of shit, but the psych drugs I was taking seemed to be helping me. And it was confusing to me. I wrote a story about it. And, and, and I talked about my, my, my complicated feelings about it. And I, I learned this thing that when you tell a story um, and you, you make yourself vulnerable, inevitably what happens is there's other people that want to tell their stories to you. And so that's what happened. All these people, all these people found me. And we started this thing, the Icarus Project. Um, it started with my friend Jax, who's shown up here tomorrow night. We're going to be speaking at a at the ISPS conference together. But um, it, it, it grew into this thing that had thousands, tens of thousands of people connected to it. Um, one of the things I learned about language is that you can, you can take a bunch of different people's language and put it together and um, create some new language. And that's what we did. We wrote this book called Navigating the Space Between Brilliance and Madness, a Reader and Roadmap of Bipolar Worlds. It was basically just, we just took all the best parts of um, the discussion forums we had. This was like pre-social media. And, um, and then all of a sudden there was people all around the country that were like, you know, getting together in groups and, and, and talking about it, you know? And we put out this book called Friends Make the Best Medicine, a guide to creating community mental health support networks. And all of a sudden, there were all these people who felt inspired to get together in person to have conversations about what mental health and mental illness looked like to them. And it was cool. Um, at some point later, we put out this book called The Harm Reduction Guide to Coming Off Psychiatric Drugs, which was mainly written by a man named Will Hall. And it, it, it ended up sparking all these really important conversations because there's all these people who, there's like so much pressure in our society to go on psychiatric drugs and there's very little, there's very little help to get off of them. It's just one of the things that we're, we're living with in our society. There's so many people out there that are struggling taking drugs. And, and what we were saying was not, don't ever take psych drugs. We were saying, if you're going to take these drugs, understand why you're taking them. Don't take them because you think you have a biological brain disease. You know, take them because you're sensitive, you know, and you need help in the world. And what and, and what are the things you don't have that if you had, you'd be able to get off the drugs? Anyway, it, it caused a lot of good things to happen, I would say. It was positive. And it was outside the system. And in fact, a few years after this guide came out, we heard that the, the American Psychiatric Association made their own version of it. You know? So that would that would be an example of the underground affecting the mainstream. 
All right, so I made this slide. I made this this slide last night. I was in that hotel room, like I was telling you about. And I was thinking about how I've, I've never I've never said it like this before. Because man, I have I have talked about being locked up in psych wards countless times. I've talked about my like really intense, you know, like how all the different ways I'm so crazy. But now that it's like years later and I'm a therapist, I understand a lot of things that I didn't understand back then. When I wrote that original Bipolar World article, it was all kind of mysterious to me. Now it makes a lot more sense. I, I'm just gonna share this slide with you. It's a very personal slide. So that's my mom and dad. And that's actually a book that my dad wrote uh, that was published in 1977. And, um, and that's a picture of the Berlin Wall. <clears throat> and, and I've come to think about, now I, I'm talking about myself, but I want you to, to, to take a moment and just think for yourself, is there anything in your life, do you have any, are there any situations in your life where there, you have different parts of yourself that aren't talking to each other or maybe don't even realize that they exist? Because we all have them. Um, I'm going to tell you about mine. I had this mother and father who both loved me very much, but like really hated each other, and in, and in many ways kind of um, epitomized something about the, the, the generation I came of age in. You know, my mom was, my dad was like a, like a working class Irish Catholic, 1950s like man's guy, and my, and, and my mom, you know, she was a working class Greek Jew from the Bronx, and who was very affected by the second wave of feminism, and was like, in 1977, was like, fuck you, man, and left my dad. And I am the product of these two people. I am the, um, <laughs> the product of the, the, like, what was going on back then. And, and we, I could, it could, it's very personal, but it, it's also, there's, there's, there's something, there's something larger going on. Okay, here's where we veer into the part of the couple slides where, like, you know, I'm going to do my best here. Okay, this is this is a placeholder for like a much better slide I'm gonna make at some point. <laughs> but like you have to understand, like from like the way that I got to be the person that I am, first of all, my dad died when I was thirteen and and then I became like a very rebellious teenager and I was really into punk rock. And the thing about punk rock was that it was like it was like uh, a style of music, but it was also a social movement that came out of the late 1970s and the political ferment of all the shifts and changes that were happening back in those days. Um, that, you know, 1977 in, in, in New York City, like, literally my first memory was like the blackout of 1977, which was like, you know, when the whole city went black and there was looting and fires. There was buildings all over New York City that were being torched to so, so that the landlords could connect, you know, collect their insurance, um, and there was like, it, it was a really, it was a, it, it was a very um, scary time, I think, for a, for a lot of people, and it was happening all over too. And in England, you know, in London, there were there were like similar issues happening. Um, and what 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 I'm trying to express here that I, I have to explain to you, because I didn't do a good job on the slide, is that the the top two albums there are the Sex Pistols and the Clash, who were like kind of main, they, they made it to the mainstream, right? But then there was also all this like really interesting underground punk rock that was happening, like the crass and the subhumans. And they had a relationship to each other. There was a relationship between the underground and the mainstream. Um, and uh, yeah, I could talk about that for days, but I'm not going to. Instead, what I'm gonna do is talk specifically, to, and, and by the way, this all started because, the reason I decided to do this is because Nev, originally invited me to speak to her social work class and she was like, can you think of a song that you think you, you know, that you want to, you know, share with the class? And I was like, hmm, that's a song I want to share with the class. So I'm going to share a song with you. I'm not actually going to play it, but you can, you can find it yourselves later. So, so there was this band, it was like really kind of this amazing band called X-Ray Specs. And the lead singer, her name was Polly Styrene. This is all taking place like in London, or right? so it's like the first wave of punk rock. X-Ray Specs is playing with the Sex Pistols. She's a teenager. I think, you know, one of her parents is Somali, the other is like Scotch-Irish, you know. She's like a fucking weirdo. And it turns out later she gets diagnosed with bipolar disorder. But like, in 1977 they put out this record called Germ-Free Adolescence. And the record was actually out of print 
for many years and then didn't come back into print until like 1992 when I went off to college in Portland, Oregon, and I got a copy of it. I think the Hare Krishna is on the right suit, but that's like a whole other story, whatever. Um, so just picture me, I'm 18 years old, right? And I'm, I'm leaving home for the first time, trying to figure out all the things you're trying to figure out when you're a teenager, like leaving home. And I was having a hard time. And I was also smoking a lot of the, the weed in, on the West Coast at the time was way stronger than the weed in New York City where I grew up. So that, that definitely contributed to it. Um, I was drinking a lot of strong coffee. And I basically, my first psychotic breakdown, like I can trace it when I like tell the story to myself and try to figure out where it happened. I remember the moment where I had that first break with reality. I was listening to X-ray specs alone in my alone in my dorm room, and I was listening to this song. And I'll, I'll I'll tell you the lyrics. I can just recite them. Identity. It's the crisis. Can't you see? When you look in the mirror, do you see yourself? Do you see yourself on a TV screen? Do you see yourself in a magazine? When you see yourself, does it make you scream? Identity. It's the crisis. Can't you see? When you look in the mirror, do you smash it quick? Do you take the glass and slash your wrists? Did you do it for fame? Did you do it in a fit? Did you do it before you read about it? And just like, I don't know, do your best. Uh, picture me as an 18 year old, alone in the storm room, listening to X-ray specs. And I, and I like had this break from reality and I suddenly was like, oh my God, my entire life is a social construct. And actually like, I'm the person who wrote it. I'm the author. In fact, I am, I am, a, I must be God. I mean, that, this is the only way to understand like what it is that I'm, I'm going through. And I spent, that was like sometime in the springtime, I was sick, it was, a, it was a rough time, and also like, look, just, man, when your dad, I didn't mention the part of my, about my dad having cystic fibrosis and me watching him slowly die in front of me, but like, that's what happened. And I didn't process any of that stuff, so as an 18 year old, I was convinced I was going to die. And I was convinced that, the, you know, then, and then it was like, am I going to die or is the world going to end? And then I was convinced the world was going to end. And I was walking around, like, Portland, Oregon, but then eventually New York. And I just had this vision that the world was about to end and that I was going to play some really important role in, like, the transformation of the world to the next level of reality. And what ended up happening was one night in like August 1993, I hadn't slept for a really long time, and I was convinced that, you know, I was being broadcast live on television on all the channels, and that there was like some whole other reality that was like television that was like not our reality, and that I was, I was about to go be with all the people who were in that reality. I got on the subway tracks at 23rd Street and 6th Avenue, and I walked all the way. When they pulled me off those tracks, it was at the Christopher Street station, so that was like a long way that I walked. And I, I was totally convinced that what I was doing was exactly what I was supposed to be doing, you know? And, you know, lo and behold, I got a diagnosis of bipolar 1 with psychotic features. Like, what would you do? You would get the same diagnosis. <laughs> I mean, I was crazy, right? Um, I'm not sure what the next slide is. <laughs> well, I, I think I, I think what I want to do here is transition back from my personal story and then just go back to the to the larger to the larger social political reality, um, and just if we want to understand the biomedical model, if we want to understand like how I got diagnosed, why they diagnosed me with it, we have to understand that basically the, 19s and the 1960s and 70s were a wild time and that the whole discipline of psychiatry was in a huge crisis, a huge crisis. Like the, the foundations of the whole way of thinking about um, it, back then, you know, actually the, the, the hegemonic, the dominant model was psychoanalysis, right? That was like the, that was like the, the major framework. And, and biopsychiatry in many ways could be seen as a way, it was a way of kind of shoring up 
all these different things, you know, like kind of just consolidating, consolidating a kind of power. I've spliced in here some slides that I, that, uh, this is the kind of stuff that I talk about a lot these days. I talk a lot about systemic family therapy. And I, and I want you to just humor me here and let me, let, let me make a, there's this thing, I don't know, like, um, they call it loose associations. Have you ever heard that term? That's, the, that's what happens when like, people like me go into a psychiatrist's office and start talking, you know? And they're like, association. Um, but I'll try to not make this be too loose. I, I, think, the, I think the thing that I really want to impart to you all is that the personal story that I just told you, that like, very personal story, is a reflection of is a reflection of a larger a larger system a larger society and I think it's important when I'm when I'm working with people I see them as individuals in fact I see them like their their internal dynamics but I see it in a larger a larger way of framing how things happen in the world um, and the the key point, if I was just going to like just try and get really clear about it, what I'd say is that when I was 18 years old, what happened to me, um, what happens to so many people at a similar point in their lives, there was a potential in that in those times for something really amazing to happen. It, you could look at it as pathology and say, oh. Oh, that guy, oh yeah, he's, you know, well, he had a genetic predisposition to bipolar disorder, and so therefore we give him these antipsychotic meds or whatever. But what it's missing is that there's some people who are just sensitive and have a hard time fitting into society for, for, for various reasons. And what we desperately need is to understand that the model that we have for thinking about what it means to be human is really, really off, and we need a different model. So I'm going to I'm going to give you I'm going to give you an example of something from history that got buried, and um, and I hope that I, I hope you enjoy it or appreciate it as much as me. All right, so here's the deal. <laughs> Mainstream underground. Okay, so picture it. It's like the 1950s, the 1960s, psychoanalysis was the mainstream way of looking at at, uh, at mental health, and it was very individually based. It was like, how do we, how do we, um, you know, look at you know the different drives that you have, and what's your relationship with your mom, and all all that all that stuff. But there was like this counterculture movement at the time that ended up growing into what ended up bec becoming you know, called systemic family therapy that saw things really differently. And so I'm just going to give you like a brief, brief little like, little homeopathic dose of systemic family therapy for you to like take with you and hopefully it'll like do something in your system to change things. So there was this guy Gregory Bateson, he was brilliant and he was really the first person to apply systems thinking to human interactions. Uh, in, the, in the 1950s and 60s a lot of people were talking about um, this idea this idea of systems thinking, this idea that um, of focusing on the pattern of relationships within a system rather than the, the substance of its parts. Okay, so that was being looked at in lots of different ways. But like Gregory Bateson was looking at the family, and he had this idea he called the double bind theory of schizophrenia, which is basically the idea that communications within families can create impossible situations that lead to distress and confusion, often seen in psychosis. This shows how contradictory messages can foster psychological fragmentation and confusion. So this was like, this was an idea, it was countercultural, but there were a lot of people who were talking about it. And, you know, I'm going to read you this line that I like. It's kind of a, it's, it's, it's a heavy sentence, but um, I think it's, it's powerful. Gregory Bateson's theory of the double bind came from a theoretical attempt to imagine the kind of interpersonal communication context 
in which psychotic ideas and symptoms would seem adaptive. Another way of saying that is, when you're living in a fucking crazy environment, it can drive you fucking crazy. And that's the, that like, the, like, and then suddenly you're acting crazy and people are like, oh, that's the crazy one over there, you know? Gregory Bateson was the same one who popularized this language of the identified patient. So he, he viewed the identified patient as, if you have a family, one person is the identified patient. One person is the, the person who's like, oh, they're the one who's sick. <coughs> he viewed the, the patient as a symptom bearer of the family's systemic issues, where the individual's behavior reflects the dysfunctions and patterns within the larger family system, rather than a problem isolated to the individual alone. You might, you know, just take a moment to reflect on how you've probably never heard this before. Or if you have, it was probably so, like in some obscure context, this was how so many people were talking about it before the like biopsychiatry came along and basically crushed this whole way of thinking. There was like a whole way of thinking. I'm gonna give you another example, because I this is when I discovered this stuff, I was like, I can't believe this. I've been like, you know, doing this work for many years. I have this diagnosis, trying to make sense of like how how we are in the world. Check this out. Like, I'm, I guarantee that, like, you know, maybe some of you know about this, but probably most of you don't. There's an organization called the National Institute of Mental Health. <laughs> uh, it's like mostly, like, the work they're doing is like, you know, focused on like biomarkers and all, all, all kinds of stuff like that. In the late, in the, in the, in the 19th, in the late 1950s, there was this guy, Murray Bowen, he was the head of the NIMH. He was bringing whole families there, and he had this understanding that schizophrenia, this is the language that they were using back then, was, a, was not an individual issue, it was a family issue. It was a family issue. And the thing is, there's many reasons people don't talk about this stuff now, right? There's like the, the rise of the pharmaceutical industry, the rise of neoliberal economic policies that shifted managed care, you know, into the system and change, change things. But there's also all the shame. And there's also, like, I alluded to it before, when I was a teenager and I got diagnosed bipolar, my mom went to these meetings with a bunch of other families. It was called the National Alliance of the Mentally Ill. And they were like, it's not your fault. It, he has a, it's an illness, it's like diabetes, he just has to take his meds, you know? And that was like, that, that was a story. Talk about good stories. That was a really good story that was woven together that um, basically erased a whole bunch of other stories, you know? I think in life, we can look at our own, we can look at our own personal experiences and I think that it's empowering to do it but we can also look at like the larger society like I I have a client who's who's Israeli American and we and and we end up talking a lot about the Israeli Palestinian conflict and in many ways like the what's happening what's happening over in the Middle East right now it's like the result of some it's not it's not dissimilar from biopsychiatry. Like, those, like the, the state of Israel, like, love to everyone over there, and like, look, we want peace to reign, and it's like, no one, you know, we don't, like, like I'm, I'm, I want nothing but, like, peace and justice for, for everyone. But man, at the end of World War II, you know, when things were happening, like they were putting up the Berlin Wall, and they were trying to figure out what to do. What do we do with the Jews? What do we do with them? You know, okay, well, there was this idea that was like, okay, well, we'll have this, like, Zionist state. Well, it turns out maybe it wasn't the best idea. <laughs> but, but, like, all this time later, there are all these people who are all wrapped up in their, this, like, really intense drama. Like, like, like let's go back to that X-ray spec song, Identity, you know? Like, what is identity? Like, or is, it, is it the country that we're from? Is it like the people who have died so that we could live on the soil that we live on? Is it the, you know, like what, like, what makes us who we are? Um, and people get trapped in these binds. There's a way that like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not dissimilar from someone diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, you know? And I, I just think we need to like, 
like in, in many ways, uh, I look at what happened in the in like this period from the from the late fifties to like the late seventies. There were so many good ideas about um, working with people and working with in groups, thinking about psychosis not as an individual thing, but as a group thing. Um, and I think we need to. To, to just recognize, we, we need to be able to go back there somehow. Now, how does that actually translate to the first episode of Psychosis program that I worked on, where they, you know, are thinking in this very individual way, and it's all like the way they do their research, and they, like, I don't know, but I, I think it has to come from the outside. It has to come from the underground, and then influence the, the larger culture. So let's see what, let's see what I put next. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think it's just important we understand that there's like, when we're talking about, when we're talking about history, like, there are these moments in time, we're in one right now. We're, we're in it right now and we can't see it because it, it, it's not history yet. But we're going to look back and be like, whoa, whoa, whoa you know, like, th like, we'll be able to see with much better clarity what led us up to how we got here, you know? And, and I can look at 1980 pretty clearly and see how we got, how we ended up with the biopsychiatric model. And it has to do with the larger political times. Um, this is a slide that, this is like, you'll find this on my practice website. I have a very untraditional practice website. I mean, I basically like went to, um, I went to, uh, I got my master's and then I did three years at the Psychiatric Institute and then I didn't want to go get my clinical license because the way they talk about people like me, the way clinicians talk about people like me does not make me feel safe. So I just decided I wanted to do my own thing. So that's, that's what I do basically. But I do end up doing things like, um, so this is a, a, pro a project called Transformative Mutual Aid Practices which is I had like the, you know, I had the pleasure of getting to train all these peer workers all over the country who were working on these first episode psychosis programs and this was the kind of, um, this is how I did it, basically. It was like a, it, it was, it's a set of questions and it was designed to replicate um, being on the Old Icarus Project discussion forums because it's basically like there's a question, right here, no, but like, what, what does it feel like when I'm most alive? And then it has a whole bunch of different responses from different people. And you can, you're like, it's a way, it's a way to get groups of people together to to, to have interesting conversations with each other. And then simultaneously to working at the psychiatric institute, you know, my friends and I started the Institute for the Development of Human Arts. Um, folks, Jesse Roth, like folks are going to be at the ISPS conference as well, um, but really what we're doing is is different than what a lot of people are doing because we're bringing together people with all kinds of different experiences and not narrowing mental health or illness down to the to the medical frame and hopefully we're doing our best not to get caught in too many polarizations but these are the kind of th things like if you go to the ida website you can a lot of it is like online it like during the pandemic uh, you know things got Everything went online, so so yeah, so that's it. I got to the end of my I got to the end of my talk. Um, I I really want to thank all of you for listening because uh, for me it's like um, I think that there's I don't think I'm alone in this. Like I think there's like the parts that feel comfortable speaking and then the parts that are like scared to to talk. Um, and then they, they all have to learn how to work with each other. So, um, getting up and talking in front of people gives me the opportunity to like get my internal self together. Anyway, thank you very much.
Okay, so yeah, oh, sorry, we're, th this room is being renovated right now, so all the technology is temporary technology. We have no handheld mics. Um, so for kind of question and answer discussion now, um, if you want to end up on the recorded version, just come up here and speak into the mic. Otherwise, if you can just project really loudly with your question um, so that we can hear it. Yeah, in the back. Should I come up there? Yeah, come up here. Sure. Yeah. Totally up to you. Yeah, it doesn't Hello, I really appreciated the talk. Um, I just wanted to ask, so I'm a um, uh, jazz musician, uh, improvising musician here, and I'm over at the, uh, uh, in the music department of the Jazz Studies program, and I run a bunch of um, uh, community oriented participatory um, creative music uh, series around the, the area with uh, a bunch of different other people. But I'm interested in studying the role of improvisation and how this might be able to be a form of, of cultural therapy, like various Im improvisational practices. So I was just wondering if you could maybe highlight through your practice where you see um, improvisation showing up, um, just anywhere. All right, so great question. Okay, the first thing that comes to mind is that um, when I was a social work student, I had this internship at this place called the Parachute Project where we were all trained in this modality called open dialogue. And open dialogue was basically a, a it's like a family therapy model where um, you're sitting with a family, one person is diagnosed with a psychotic disorder and then the rest of the family's there and then you're sitting and, and basically facilitating a conversation. One of the principles of open dialogue is what they call polyphony, which I believe is a term for music theory. It and, is, yes. Yeah, and, and the idea, the way it's used in open dialogue is it's this, uh, it's this idea that rather than looking for a kind of truth, like well, what's the right answer, the, the yes or the no, the you know, do I take meds, do I not take meds, like what? You elicit responses from everyone and those responses put together creates a polyphony that then helps inform what to do next. So that's like, that's like the, the immediate answer that I have, but I also think about, um, there was a period of my life where I was really interested in um, gestalt therapy, and in, 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 there was this guy, there was this uh, Romanian Jew, what was his name? Oh, I can't remember his name, but he's the guy who developed, he's the guy who coined the term psychodrama, Jacob Moreno, Jacob Moreno. And um, he had this vision that you could get groups of people together, like anything that was like, the, yeah, every, the existentialists at the time were all talking about how like, oh, you know, urban society was all, you know, what were we going to do? There was all this alienation, like the alienation was a new thing. And he was like, I have the answer. We just get groups of people together and we act out our, you know, our, 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 inner, our, our inner dramas, our inner work. And um, there's a whole kind of that thread from psychodrama to what's called drama therapy now. In the 1960s and 70s, there was like this whole thing called encounter groups. And there was a whole bunch of it that like, like some of the stuff that I was talking about earlier, got kind of crushed or like erased, partially because it was like the, the the boundaries are really sketchy, and there were all these like like power dynamics where there was like sketchy guys sleeping with sleeping with the younger women, and the, the whole like there there was all, lots of sketchy things that happened in the 60s and 70s. It all got kind of cleaned up, and it's called drama therapy now, and you can go to school and get a degree in it. <laughs> um, and I think that within that, like the, there are all these threads that are like based on improvisational techniques. You know, it's like, okay, you and I, we're going to act out now, like, your relationship with your dad, you know, or whatever, and then we're, and, and, and then what happens? And then you have someone watching it, there's like a third person who's watching it, and then it's like, okay, and then you get together and you talk about it, and then you do it again. That's what I got for you, man. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your presentation. I'm just curious to know what the um, the mainstream mental health system, how they've accepted you or how they have 
discouraged you or encouraged you to do the work that you're doing? Because oh, okay. you're certainly well known. I mean, I know that. Like it's hard to tell. One of the things about like being diagnosed with a psychotic disorder, like for real, this is like I'm saying. I'm like, I, um, how do I say this in a way that other people will understand it? Sometimes I'll, I'll answer your question, but the first way I'll answer it is, sometimes I'm not sure if it's all just a story I made up, and that if there's anyone else. Like I, I think I'm crazy. I've been told crazy so I've been crazy so many times that, well, you know, you can say like, oh, I've heard the Eucharist project, great, but I, I could, I like very much relate to. I could also just be like walking down the street talking to myself, like, just a cra crazy, alienated person. How does the mainstream? I, I, I feel like uh, I have this like, I have this wild. Those three years that I spent working at the Psychiatric Institute were like really hard for me. It was really, Ned no, she was like, she, she saw me and like, you know, she was like one of the few people, there were a few people that like got what was happening. But basically, I was the only person on this entire team of people that was out about being diagnosed with a psychotic disorder and no one else understood, really understood what, like, what the hell, like, my perspective was. And I think a lot of people, I, you know, I was friendly with people, and there's still people I, I, I like who are, you know, in, in that world, but I feel like people were scared of me, you know? I feel like there was, like, fear in some ways, because they didn't understand. I would be sitting there at my desk, everyone would leave, and I'd be sitting there furiously writing, you know, working on my stuff, and I, no one took the work Ser the people took their work seriously, but not in the way that I did, because it was so fucking personal, you know? Like, I was, like, really, like, like, really determined to try to make changes, and I would get really frustrated. Um, and there were a number of times where I thought I was going to get fired at that job, and that might have just been in my head, I, you know, this is hard, it's hard. But, okay, but the, another way I'll answer your question is, the head of the Psychiatric Institute at the time was a man named Jeffrey Lieberman, who was, like, the... The spokesperson for the biological model and the you know, schizophrenia, and I just thought he was a buffoon, you know. Like I just like I couldn't. I just I like, and and there was like another character. I can't. I, it's, it's hard to like, give you a straightforward answer. There was like another this kind of amazing person in that world. Um, was this woman Pat Deegan, who was my mentor, like. Pat Deegan is someone who figured out, she was diagnosed with schizophrenia and then set up her whole own thing. I think if you look, any of those, um, you know, if you look at articles about recovery, um, you'll usually see a citation, Deegan 1988, because she's the person that, that started talking about recovery and mental health. And so I would meet with Pat Deegan regularly, and she was, she was awesome. She was a, she, you know, she was a mentor to me. Um, but I watched her... I watched her interactions with Jeffrey Lieberman, and he really disrespected her. And um, okay, this is the last thing I'm going to say. I don't think I've had. I don't think. I don't think the mainstream psychiatric establishment knows who I am yet, and I really want them to. And I look forward to. It. I really. I really. I, really want, I, I like. I want to have the kind of public conversations that we're having right now, but with people, like on stages where more people are, are watching and we're, we're talking about this stuff. That's what I, 2025, that's my, that's my desire. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Now you guys have questions. I just want to add to, to, to Jummy's question or to the response that, I mean, it really was like a dream when Sasha was at the Psychiatric Institute. It was a period of like, what, around three years where it really felt like something different was possible and then it was out just like that. Um, I do think there's just such a resistance to really change. So to embrace like a deeper, let's do things differently. And I think that was the really tragic thing because I think in a sense people were trying to listen to Sasha and trying to understand 
but just couldn't go that far. It's like they just really got stuck, and then immediately, once Sasha was out of the picture, right, it's just sort of back to the status quo, the same old way of doing things. But, you know, we have to keep fighting the good fight. Hello. Um, I'm Amanda. I'm, a, I'm an alumnus from Duquesne's program, um, and I was qualified to get my license 10 years ago, but I just got it, so I feel you. I'm not ready to get my license then. Also, I want to say I bought the um, uh, Navigating Between Brilliance and Madness like back in, I think, 2005 or something awesome. when I was a graduate student, um, and I was, looking, I was looking for stuff like that, and I was glad to have it. Um, I still have it. I'm going to shop at home. I guess the question that I was thinking about today, um, and now I'm thinking about again, sitting here, is, you know, how do we be just like enfranchised in our sensitivity? And I think maybe the deeper question to that is like, how do we know what's real? <laughs> yeah. um, because I think for myself, you know, I've spent many, many years, um, I don't have a diagnosis of a psychotic disorder, but I could have easily gotten one if circumstances had been right, or if I had said certain things to certain people when I chose not to say certain things to certain people. Um, things are pretty weird, but I'm like an assistant professor, and I have a psychology license, and I, you know, a, like, so not really upstanding, but I'm a member of society, but, um, but like navigating, Navigating the other way of seeing, you know, Joseph Campbell is right. Sometimes we're drowning, sometimes we're swimming. But being a mystic isn't that respected either. It's not like people get that and say, oh, she's really, she's really nailing it. She's so on point with the nature of reality. So I don't know. Um, do you have thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Do I have thoughts? <laughs> See what comes out of my mouth, and we'll find out. That, um, the question about the reason I like that Joseph Campbell quote so much is that it's a it's a way to acknowledge. It's like it's a way to acknowledge that there's water, which gets back to this question of like, what's the water? You know, the schizophrenic drowns in the water that the mystic swims in with the light. What's the water? You know, but. All the people that were treating me when I was a teenager, they didn't see any water. You know? Um, I think... I left this part out, just because it's like, you know, how do you tell a whole story, but... Part, you know, the thing when I was a little kid was that, basically from the time I was three years old, I was just watching television all the time. You know, like that was the constant thing between my mom's house and my dad's house was the same TV shows. You know, the family sitcoms were like became my kind of surrogate families, and we don't talk enough in this culture about the water. You know, we don't talk about our dreams. Like, how wild is it that we all dream every night? You know, and what's the relationship between our dreams and our waking reality? And then what happens? we end up in some situation where there's like literally a reality TV show star is like running the country, you know? <laughs> and it, who, the, whose dream are we in, you know? Like who's, whose dream are we living in? I think that's like, a, I forget the exact quote, but there's this really great woman writer, Adrienne Marie Brown, and she, she has this thing that's like, the, I need to, I need to, in order to step out of the nightmare that I'm living in, I have to be able to, to dream my own dreams. I need to be, a, be able to be a visionary. And I just think that there's such an important role for, for visionaries, and like, how do we take care of each other? But your question about like, what is real, I don't know, it's a big ass question. We could. You know, like we could, like I could tell you about how I went through a period. I think I'll say it like this: 
I think there's some people, my kids right now, I'm pretty sure, are growing up securely attached in a stable family unit, and they're so, so far, they're pretty, pretty healthy kids. By the time I was their age, I was already like banging my head against walls and, you know, having a really hard time, you know? Um, I think that there's like a lot of people who, I think there's, there's people who have happy childhoods who like are just adjusted and can like go be all right, and then there's people who, who have like unresolved shit. And for those people, it's harder to know what is real, you know? But, but then there's like an incredible freedom because if you don't know what's real, you have to make up your, you have to make up some new story. Basically, that's what I've done. I've made up a different story, you know, than like the one that was given to me as what was real. And how do I know it's real? Because I keep telling it, and I and I and I, you know, find other people, and we we tell. There's a there's there's like our individual stories, and then there's like collective stories. What are the stories that we all tell together? Um, and it's important we tell good stories. That's that's I'm gonna I'm gonna stop talking there. Well, I was gonna say is it, so for me it seems like a good story is partly one that works. Like it can take root. Yeah. It has traction. You can do something. Yeah, yeah. Like you the, can live on it. Yeah, and like the, the mystic story, the mystic thing that you were talking about is like why people don't, people don't, you know, people don't have respect for mystics. Yeah, because that story doesn't work so well in this in this context, but maybe something else will, you know? Like, I don't know. Sounds like, sounds like you know what's going on. I would <laughs> 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 like, we could just talk about it some more, some other time, or what, yeah, what more, more. That, the, the one last thing I want to say is that, you know, in working with students and clients, it's like, how do I help them be grounded? Oh, okay, so that's what I was going to say. Clients are letting me think, this is like, what a joy to just be like, oh, people are going to listen to me? And I'm like, Great. Um, I did this program with Jax, or Jax McNamara is the person I started the Icarus Project with, and we both did this eight-month program called Somatics and Trauma, and, and uh, Jax ended up becoming a somatic coach, and I didn't, but I learned a bunch of stuff in the process, and the, there, it, was, it was with a program called Generative Somatics, there's a bunch of social justice activists, it was very intense, very, very highly politicized, but the, it, it was all about grounding and centering. It was all about like, it was like, feel into your, your, your length and your width and your depth and then, you know, make a commitment to something and hold that commitment. So I think it's like very, there's like a lot of coaching stuff that's like that. But I think that stuff would be very helpful. I don't know. That's it. You. <laughs> Hey, I'm Elizabeth. Um, first of all, thank you so much for this talk. It's really rung a lot of bells for me. And um, I really resonated with your dandelion metaphor um, and your kind of evocation of punk scenes at a particular time. Um, and also contextualizing the present moment as really historically significant, a time of really dramatic changes and you know, I, I almost wonder if changes maybe even in the nature of that water on some level. Um, and so I guess I have two questions related to that. One is what scenes or subcultures or movements in music or art or anything do you feel like now, what's going on now, feel potentially kind of generative or informative for this moment, for responding to or dealing with or making sense of what is happening and what's about to happen. Um, and the second question is, how do we draw that up from the underground into the mainstream while also protecting it from co-option and distortion? So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on either of those. God, you really asked like the question that I like, I mean that's, that like, yeah, who, who should we be paying attention to, and then how do we, how, like, how do we hold, how do we hold what's happening um, in a way that it doesn't just go and get co-opted and marginalized? I don't have an answer for you. I, I've spent the last four years, like, in a little bubble. I get most of my 
most of my social interaction is talking to clients on screens, you know, and then I'm just taking care of little kids. So I, I don't know. Um, I, 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 I want to know the answer to that question. I mean, I, I can do a better job of answering the second part, which is like, what do we do about co-optation? You know, when um, when I I mean when I worked at the when I worked at the psychiatric institute, God, there was a woman named Darby Penny who was dead now, and she um, she was like a she was a really intense woman. And when I got hired at that job, she yelled at me and she told me that I was just going to hurt people by working in the system. She was like she was like she was she was an angry survivor who would, it was like a really like angry. Angry woman, <laughs> um, but I, I thought about her words all the time when I was in there. And the reason she could do that is because she had had a similar job in the system, you know, and just watched the stuff she had done get co-opted. She was very bitter about it. Um, there's a real game, you know, to like being able to um, being able to like play in that world. I don't, honestly, it's a great question, and if we were just like sitting down talking, I would be happy to answer, but I th I'm like, I don't, I'm like, what do we do about co-optation? Co-optation is just part of the, that's part of what happens. I mean, it, it, things have their moment, and then they shed their skin, and then they're not, you know, when I was 19, I played in a punk rock band, and it, there was this band called Green Day that was from our same scene and then ended up on the cover of Rolling Stone. And then that band Nirvana that was also just like another local band. And then suddenly they were like, they were so popular. And what that did to our punk scene, it changed the dynamics of it. Suddenly there was like a ton more people who identified with it, which is what you want. But at the same time, it like watered down what it was we had. And my band got signed to a, a, a label and now there's all like, I think there's probably more people who know me because of that band than from any you know anything else I've done. What do we do with that? I, I don't know. I'm I'm really interested in it. I'm I'm fucking I'm gonna be fifty years old next month. I really want to know how we change things, and and I want to be a part of changing things in a in a large way. I, I'm like I said at the beginning of this talk. I'm scared about the coming changes, but I also understand that crisis is it like has all this opportunity in it too and that things that seem really small and underground can get big i don't know i don't know we we craft it well you know we cra like i think in some ways i feel like i've been a part of a lot of projects that have um the mistakes that were made were because because they were like identifying so much with leftist ideology and 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 I like identity politics and I feel like that's something there's like a there's a way that um, that's really I didn't really talk about it in the presentation but it's like a, it's like a thread there that you know that that like identity is really important it's important to have a sense of who you are and then at some point to let go of it and realize that you're part of something much larger. And I think I think also that all the movements that I've been a part of have in common that they've been made up of people who were really like intense and traumatized. And that will create a certain shape to to like who gets to access who get you know, who and like and like the sense of being an insider or an outsider. Um, and I, yeah, and then I spent a lot of time thinking about, honestly, like, this is the best way I can answer your question, you know? I think a lot about race dynamics in this country, and I think a lot about black culture and how black, um, like, rock and roll was black music, and then it became white music, and then it became popular. And, and then punk rock in some ways was an attempt, to, it was like a very white, movement and and like how do you how do you give props to, to where you come from 
and who gets left behind. Um, I feel like, yeah, I don't know. In the end, <laughs> and I was just telling you yesterday about like being in in, uh, in, in Italy at the, on this on this tour, and she was with Patrick Kennedy, and he kept talking about the sparks of the divinity in, in, inside everyone. And I feel like saying something along those lines, like you know, like I feel like everyone, like like everyone, even your worst enemy, has like a spark of divinity, and you have to like find that connection with other people, um, and that's like. A fundamental piece of the work in any any popular movements that are effective for social change, they're not secular movements. They're movements that have some sense of spirit and how we engage with a sense of something being larger than us. And in the end, the thing for me was that when I was 18 years old, like I had this experience of thinking I was God, thinking I was the Messiah, thinking that all, all that stuff. And then the night I met Jax McNamara, when we started the Icarus Project, Jax McNamara pulled this book off the shelf called Be Here Now by Ram Dass. And it had this line in it about how he had taken too much acid and, and uh, gone up to heaven, but then he got kicked out of heaven because he had his ego on him. And, we were, and me and Jax were just like, whoa, we really related to that. We were like, oh, so there is this divinity, there is this water, but if you identify with it and you think it's you, that's where you get into the problem. You know, listen to Donald Trump and the way he talks. He thinks he's God. That man thinks he's God, and he does. He has something. He's tuned in. He is tapped into something very deep, and that's why people like him, because he's got. He's like he's got the spirit, and we need to have the spirit, and we need to be able to like put on the X-ray specs and see past the bullshit that they're showing us. There you go. That's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think you guys were, were, were just technically at time for the formal part. Anybody can stay and keep talking to Sasha, though, so don't feel like you have to go um, come up and talk and we can have more formal conversation. Thank you guys so much for being here. Tomorrow evening, here in the same room at the cathedral, Sasha will be part of a panel. Um, and so there will be like six speakers, six panelists, so it will be more a group discussion of what does it mean to like really rethink what we're doing, how do we do things differently. Um, so please come back, there will be refreshments and, and alcohol as well at that, um, starting around uh, 5.45 tomorrow. All right, thank you guys, and thank you, Sasha.